everybody. My name is Michael Harnack, and uh, I'm here with my grandpa Andy. And um, so I'm going to ask him a tiny bit about his childhood, what it was like with his two brothers, and also a tiny bit about his career as an art, uh, about being an art, an author. So, Andy. Yes, hi. First, hi, um, okay, so first, let's start about your brothers. What were they like? Like, were they kind? Were they a tiny bit self-centered? Were they a tiny bit selfish? Or were they just really fun to hang out with? They were really fun to work with. Growing up, um, my daddy insisted that we three boys, Andy, I was the oldest, and then Gordon, and then Arthur, or Butch as we called him, we all worked together. And what did we do? Well, after school, every day since Art was in the first grade and I was in about the uh, fourth grade, we delivered papers. We had a huge route. It took three boys to put the papers to everybody's house. And so we had to walk up steps, put them inside the screen door, we had to, uh, at the end of the week, go out and collect the money for the papers. And uh, we didn't get to keep the money. We had to give it all to my daddy. We were working for him. And uh, then he took that money and he helped us to go to school with it. So we worked together. We rode bicycles and we had saddlebags on the back of the bikes with our newspapers. And we learned to fold them up so that we could throw them uh, if that was possible. But it took us about two hours every afternoon, all of us working together to, to deliver uh, the papers in Syracuse, New York. So that's mostly what I remember about my, my brothers. However, can I tell you about what we did when we went on vacation? Sure. Okay. When we went on vacation, we went to my grandparents' home in North Carolina, near Newton and Conover, North Carolina. And uh, they lived next to a, or nearby a big woods with a creek going down uh, the woods, through the woods. And uh, at that time, uh, we, and I don't know why, but we didn't wear any shoes. So we learned to walk in the woods in our bare feet. And we would go into the woods and then go down to the creek and we would look for crayfish. And we would take a shovel down with us and in the middle of the creek we would dig a big hole. Well, we thought it was big. It was probably about two feet deep. Uh, so we could have a swimming pool in the middle of the creek. I remember one time my grandmother came down with us and as we were sitting on rocks near the creek, all of a sudden my grandmother screamed and she grabbed us and she pulled us up the hill to her house because a great big rattlesnake was coming down the creek and my grandmother was frightened of snakes. Um, so we had a good time. We met all kinds of neighborhood kids, went to their homes to eat sometimes. Sometimes they came to our home. But the most important person I remember when I was a little boy with my brothers was not so much my dad, who went to work uh, with a construction company that my grandfather owned, but my Aunt Pearl. Uh, excuse me, Aunt Rose. Aunt Pearl was my godmother. Aunt Rose would come and we would play um, Monopoly. Uh, and uh, she would take us for rides. And I so enjoyed her, her life with us. She was just a wonderful uh, aunt for us. Um, so uh, other things I remember, Michael, we ha when I lived in... Uh, York, Pennsylvania, I went to a little Lutheran school called St. John's Parochial School. It was about a mile away from our house, and we had to walk it together a mile to the school and then a mile back. The other things I remember about my childhood was roller skating. But it wasn't quite like it is today because all the sidewalks were made of bricks.
So when you roller skated, you were constantly as you went down, you know, the street. Um, I remember my grandfather, he was kind of tight with money. So, for example, one Christmas, he didn't give us each a gift. He gave one gift to the three boys. It was a jackknife that had three blades. So Andy had a blade, my brother Gordon had a blade, and Butch had a blade. That's the kind of way uh, uh, the Harnocks were back then. Uh, I went off to school. I decided when I was in the eighth grade that I wanted to be a pastor. I don't know how or why I decided. I just decided I wanted to be one. So I went to school uh, in Bronxville, New York, north of New York City, to begin studying to be a pastor. And at that time, I had to learn four languages, German, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. But I didn't start my Hebrew and Greek until later on, but when I went to high school, I started studying German. Kennen Sie Deutsch sprechen? Do you speak German? Nope. Okay. Um, and then I had to learn uh, Latin. And uh, then when I got to college, my first year of college, we started with Greek with one of the most wonderful professors I've ever had in my life, Eugene Nissen. And then when I got to seminary, we started our Hebrew. So uh, I have forgotten all my Hebrew. It's such a different language. But I still read Greek. I read my, my Greek Bible almost every day. In fact, I taught Greek uh, for a little bit when I was a professor. Uh, and I feel comfortable being in Germany and asking people questions, but I don't use Latin anymore at all. So, um, are you going to be able to learn a language, Michael? Um, yes, I am actually learning Spam Spanish, and we are starting to work on um, French. Oh, so, yeah. my goodness, see, you're going to have a more cosmopolitan education than I had. So that I would love to know how to speak Spanish or how to speak French, uh, but uh, at last, I don't know how to do that. Well, um, we grew up uh, in a parsonage. Uh, I had to, as your daddy did, I had to go to catechetical classes. That's where you learn Luther's catechism. And uh, usually you went every Saturday for two years. But after I went to catechism class for two years, my father said to the little group of about eight of us, you're not doing so well. You gotta come back for a third year. So then I had to go back Saturdays from 9 till 12 for another year to learn what Martin Luther said in the Catechism. And after we thought we knew the Catechism well enough, actually you were kind of expected to memorize it, then you would be trotted out in front of the congregation. And the pastor would ask you a question, what is the Eighth Commandment? Uh, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, you'd say. And then he'd say, what does that mean? And then you'd have to repeat what Martin Luther said the Eighth Commandment meant. So that was part of my education. Um, I don't remember, I have pictures of myself in a classroom. Uh, and I, the first picture I have of myself that I can recall uh, is a picture of me at the blackboard. And I'm left-handed. So as I'm at the blackboard, I apparently have a piece of chalk in my left hand. And on the blackboard, it has the word Andy there. And that's when I first remember writing my name on a blackboard. Um, I enjoyed being left-handed. And I'll just tell you a little story. There was a time when your father was kind of not right or left-handed. He was kind of both of them. So uh, because your father uh, thinks out of the uh, le right side of his brain, he's creative. He's an artist. Uh, 
people who are artists tend to be left-handed. If, if you think out of the left side of your brain, you tend to be right-handed. And that's why if you get a mathematical problem correct, people say that's right because you've been thinking out of the left side of your brain. And your daddy is a big right hand too because he's a mathematician and can follow all, all of that. But he's also very, very creative as an artist. Um, as you can tell the way he uh, in, engages with people and talks with them. So at one time we had to decide what your daddy should be, right or left-handed, and I think we asked Kirk what he would like to be, and he may have said left-handed, but then we had to help him become left-handed. And when you have to help a person become left-handed, you, uh, you do it with certain practices. You, um, you make him sleep on his right side so he has his left hand available. You uh, help him become left dominant in his body. So your daddy, uh, we, we uh, raised, and we, he had to wear an eye patch over his right eye. And he had to have his right ear stuffed with cotton so that everything in his body was going towards the left side of all of his activities. He had to learn to throw left-handed. I don't know how left-handed your daddy is anymore. Does he still throw left-handed? Actually, yes. He does. Okay. Does he write left-handed? Um, not sure. Okay. Uh, I think that he does. Um, so anyway, um, that brought out the two best parts of your daddy, scientific thinking as an engineer and uh, artistically thinking as when he uh, interviews people and does work with his cameras and makes it all so beautiful as he's working with us now. Uh, let's see. Uh, I was told by my parents as a Lutheran, Andy, what daddy, don't you ever date somebody who's not a Lutheran? Oh, yes, sir, Daddy, okay. Well, I'll tell you, I, I, I didn't observe that very well. Um, I dated a lot of Baptists, and eventually I'm, I, I married one. Uh, and I go to a Baptist church now and then, once in a while. Um, so I was brought up rather strictly, but... Um, when you're brought up strictly, there's a tendency to break the rules, you know, just for the fun of breaking them. So uh, I was told not to smoke. Ah! As soon as I got away from the house and went to school outside New York City, I was smoking cigarettes when I was 13 years old. And uh, eventually I got to where I was smoking two packs of camels a day without a filter. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I did that for a number of years until one day when I was uh, in Lafayette, Louisiana as a Lutheran pastor, I, I woke up one morning and <laughs> I couldn't breathe. And I didn't know what was wrong with me. And I remember seeing photographs of lungs, uh, pictured, uh, pictured lungs in color by, of people who smoked. And I said to myself, I'm not going to smoke anymore. And I quit just like that. Um, eventually, though, I kind of slipped back a little bit. And I, um, I did start to smoke a pipe. Um, I have a, I have a, another son, his name is Christer, Kirk's younger brother, and uh, when Christer was at Vanderbilt University, he smoked a pipe, and after he died, uh, I found his pipe, and I began smoking it in his memory. But as your grandfather, I did learn to love other kinds of things that weren't necessarily good for me. Uh, I do like a little wine, a, a, a little uh, bourbon, uh, a little scotch. Um, I do like uh, I do like uh, to have a drink now and then. 
And I'll confess to you, Michael, uh, I was reading Proverbs in the Bible, and it said very clearly in the book of Proverbs, uh, do not drink too much wine. Well, I have drunken a little bit too much once in a while. Uh, not a whole lot, but I just want you to know that uh, your granddad has um, not always been perfect, okay? Um, and I hope that you will continue to love me even though that you know I'm not a perfect granddad. When I, um, when I gave up cigarettes, then I started running. And I could run, I could do a 10 kilometer, 10K race, and I've run in a number of them. Uh, and I got pretty good at running for a while. I haven't run recently. Um, but those, those were always fun things to do, to run uh, in, in races. Well, I'm going to let you ask me another question that you might have, okay? All righty, so um, what can you tell me about, um, well, let's start with the backstory behind your dog. Oh, my dog. I have always loved dogs, and I've had lots and lots of them. Um, my big dog, uh, Mitzi, died about uh, two and a half years ago, and uh, I I just felt so lonely. So I asked my wife, if she, June, if she would get me a dog, and so June didn't know how to do it. So she called Lisa, my oldest daughter, and she said, Lisa, would you get a dog for, for your daddy? And Lisa said, sure, I'll get a rescue dog. So uh, a little bit before Christmas, a year and a half ago, uh, we got a phone call. Dad, we have a dog for you. He's a little Pomeranian. He's um, eight years old and uh, wants to come into your house. So we drove up there, and this little dog, I had a cage for him because I didn't know whether I could trust him. And I had a leash and uh, a bridle to put around him so I could leash him. Well, listen, this dog is something. Uh, my, my veterinarian who, who takes care of him, uh, she said, how do you like your dog? I said, now don't you tell this to anybody, okay? I said, I like my dog sometimes more than my wife. And the veterinarian said, what do you mean? And I said, well, I can't get my wife to, to come in my lap for f three or four hours every day, but my little dog, Ringo, will come and sit in my lap for three or four hours. And I said, I really feel close to Ringo. Ringo is so good that he doesn't ever need a leash. Uh, I can take him uh, for a mile walk away from the house and he'll stay by me 10 or 12 feet sometimes, but always by me. And if he gets a little bit behind me, all I have to say is, Ringo, and he will come. Yeah, there he is. Hi, Ringo. Yeah. So he's, he's a very wonderful little dog. Um, he, uh, June won't let him sleep in bed, but if there's ever a time when June is away for the night, Ringo's going to come in bed and sleep with me. He always sleeps on the rug underneath, uh, by, 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 by my red side, bedside. Uh, so I have, lo I have so enjoyed uh, animals. Uh, I have had cats before, but, but June wouldn't marry me unless I gave the cats away. So uh, I, I was really a little shocked that she said, would you like to get a dog for Christmas? And I said, yes. So uh, Ringo and June get, get along very well. Ringo is very jealous, however. If I wake up in the morning and Ringo can see June and me, and if I go put my arms around June and say good morning, Ringo will bark. He doesn't want anybody coming into my life, especially my wife. So uh, I have to be careful. If I want to give June a hug, I have to say, where's Ringo? Where's Ringo? And then if Ringo's not there, I can give her a little morning hug. So he's a wonderful dog. See, he's got his, his, his head on your lap now. He just takes to people like, like everything. Okay. So um, I see that you actually have some books right there. Um, can you tell me about all those books that you have? Well, uh, first of all, I'll tell you how I got interested. I've always been a big reader. 
and you had to be a to be a seminarian studying for the ministry, studying Latin and German and Greek and Hebrew. You have to work with books, uh, and especially if you're a Lutheran pastor, you got to read everything that the Lutheran Church in the Refer time of the Reformation published in Luther's Catechisms and all of that. So I was quite comfortable with books. Um, but uh, I eventually got so comfortable with them that I started to read what we call liberal books, you know, books that uh, don't say what your parents or somebody else thought they should say. And so eventually I came to doubt a lot of stuff that was in the Bible. And in the church I was in, it was a Lutheran conservative church, you had to believe everything word for word that was in the Bible. So if the Bible says God created the uh, world in seven days, you had to say, oh yes, it was seven days. But you know, when I got into college, I started reading science and it says, no, no, no. And so I, I, I sort of said, well, wait a minute, what do I do with these Bible stories? What do I do with a story like the book of Jonah, which says he lived inside of a whale for three days? And uh, what do you do with uh, stories like uh, there was a flood that killed millions of people in the world? And uh, only eight people were rescued, Noah. And I started to say, I, I don't know. I, I, and, and when the church found out that I was having some doubts, I was teaching at a Lutheran college by this, in this conservative Lutheran church, and I was up for what's known as tenure. And Kirk was a little boy at the time. And they wanted me to sign a written statement. I believe every word in the Bible to be scientifically, historically, and factually true. And I said to myself, Andy, you, you, you can't sign that. It was called a brief statement. So I refused to sign it. And they said, well, you can't teach here anymore. Uh, I said, oh, OK. But then something wonderful happened. The president of the little college I was at in Winfield, Kansas, he said to me, Andy, could you come and visit me in my office? And I thought I was going to get chewed out. But guess what? He was a miracle in my life. His name was Stelmakowitz, Michael Stelmakowitz. And after we closed the office door, he said, Andy, you're very popular here. The students love you. I'm sorry that you can't stay with us. You have four children, Kirk, Krister, Lisa, and Amy and you have no job, and it's really hard getting a job right now. That was when Jimmy Carter was president. He said, but I am on a special insurance board called Aid Association for Lutherans, and he said, I'm going to meet with the board, and I'm going to ask that they give you a big $10,000 check so that you can go and get your doctorate degree. I was shocked. So sure enough, um, after that semester was over, I moved Kirk, your dad, and his brother and sisters down to Stillwater, Oklahoma. And down there, I spent two years getting a doctor's degree. And to do that, I had to read a lot of books. And the English department down there asked me to produce a book. To write one, so I did. I don't. I don't have a copy of that one, but after I started writing books, uh, people were getting in touch with me, because after Stillwater, I went to Eastern Kentucky University, and at Eastern Kentucky University, I was uh, eventually made the director of the writing program. I had a hundred and about a hundred professors underneath me, most of them part-time teaching, and I became, as a director of the writing program, somebody who was supposed to show them how to write. 
So I started um, books. Here's one book that I wrote. Uh, this was when the internet was coming up. And students would write a paper and they'd find something on the internet and they didn't know how to document it. So they would just put a little one and a footnote and it would say internet. And a couple of us said, hey, that's not really what we need. We need a little better documentation. So a friend of mine, Eugene Kleppinger, we decided to write a book called A Reference Guide to Using Internet Sources. Well, there are all kinds of models on how to do this. And so we had to do it with four different kinds of documentation. If you're writing a biology text, you need to have a, a science uh, model as your way of doing it. If you're in a psychology, you need a psychology. Uh, if you're in history, you need another kind. So we wrote one. and. Uh, it, uh, it has four different kinds of, uh, of, of writing styles. And at that time, when you went into a classroom and, and computers were being introduced, you had a computer here and then a computer there, and there was just a little space between the computers. So we decided to write a book that was this shape so they could go in between the computers and if you wanted to get some guidelines on how to document what you were going to put in your paper and provide the source for it, uh, there you could do it. So this became very popular. This made lots of money for me uh, and it helped me to uh, uh, put some kids through school. Then another group of people got in touch with me and I was teaching writing in classes and I was teaching documented writing. So uh, I went into my classes and there'd be maybe 20, 25 students and they would all be writing on different stuff. Some of them on uh, aerodynamics, some of them on becoming a nurse, some on different topic, this one and that one. And I couldn't tell how to, how to help them write their research papers. So I decided maybe if the entire class together wrote on one subject, they could share their research and I could teach them how to document in one way. So to show you how much I loved animals, I decided my class would write on the rights of animals. Do animals have any rights? Can you go out and just kill all the whales that you want? Or do whales have a right to live? What about monkeys in medical experimentation? Do they have any rights? Uh, so. I collected a series of essays, some for the rights and some against the rights, and I published a book called Animal Rights, Opposing Viewpoints. And there are 30 of them in here, and my class would use this and then go do some more research using this little book. Uh, another one that I wrote and developed, uh, one time I went into a class and I said, how many of you are adopted children? And about in a class of 20, maybe four people would raise their hands. They're adopted. And that's when I adopted Chelsea. So uh, there are all kinds of laws about adoption. Uh, can a, can, a, can a, a black couple adopt a white child? Can a white couple adopt a black child? Some laws were different. Some said yes, some said no. So there were many different viewpoints and I then collected them together and had this book printed, Adoption, Opposing Viewpoints. Um, then finally, um, yeah. Uh, but Ringo's going somewhere. I don't know. Uh, he's getting bored with the, with the conversation. You may want to ask him a question later on. Um, eventually, however, I was at the same time as a writer keeping notes. I kept pages and pages and journals of notes. And eventually I decided that I'd like to share my life with other people. So... Um, I prepared a manuscript several year, about six years ago 
sent it off and had somebody say, oh, we'd like to, we'd like to publish that. So they have published a first edition. And then a little later on, they published, I got a second edition published. And this has all kinds of pictures of, of my life, uh, pictures with your daddy in it, um, pictures of when I got into trouble and how I got out of it. Um, uh, let me see if I can find a picture of your daddy. Uh, yes, there he is. And there, there is you, and there is Laura. And um, over here is Krister with a football and playing basketball. And then, of course, lots of pictures when I held little Chelsea in my arms as a baby and uh, went to uh, football games with her and when we went kayaking together on the river in Kentucky. So I had this book published and it, it did very well. Uh, but it was published by a, a publishing company that people didn't know a whole lot about. Uh, and finally, one, one, one man called me and said, uh, Andy, I, we'd like to publish your book with, a, with a, the, one of the best publishers that you can find so that it gets advertised a little bit more. In the New York Review of Books, for example, or some others, or Publishers Weekly. He said, can, can, you, can you write a third edition for us? And I said, oh, I'd love to do a third edition. So in the third edition, I have more pictures of your daddy and you and my life. And uh, that book is going to be coming out in about, I'm going to guess, six weeks from now. It'll have a different cover. They did a brown cover for me. And uh, it, has a different, it has a different picture of me in the back. So uh, sometime, sometime this summer, that'll come and uh, be available for people. So yes, I like to write. Uh, I keep a journal uh, every day. I just gave your daddy a journal entry that I wrote on June 14th, uh, and he seemed to think it was a pretty good, pretty good. It was a letter addressed to Andy, dear Andy, and I wrote a letter to myself, and then I signed it. And I told myself, Andy, you read this letter to yourself lots of times so that you can remember what you want to do as you get older and older. Uh, Ringo, what you doing over there? Come here. Come on over here. Come on. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up, Ringo. Up, up. Come on. See how obedient he is? Yeah. a boy. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you, Ringo is so attractive that when I first adopted him into my life and was given to me as a gift for Christmas, he was so beautiful, I thought he was a girl. And so for a long time, I kept saying, she, she, she. And uh, look at that. See what? See how, how he likes to be held and loved? Um, so he's just a very good little boy dog, and I've got to keep remembering that and not refer to him as a she, okay? Okay. Now, I have a question for you. All righty. What's it like to be a professional interviewer? I mean, you are good. Where did you get all these tricks and all, the, all this way of doing things? Where'd you learn that from? Well, half of it comes from my dad, who is over there, the producer. And um, the other half comes from experience interviewing things like smaller things from like little visits that we would do and my dad would post them on Facebook. Oh, okay. So you've had, I'm not your first one. Um, actually, no. I've interviewed the zoo and I've also interviewed my um, legitimately rhinoceroses. Your rhinoceroses? No, not rhino. Rhinoceri. Not my. Yeah. Rhinoceri is the plural. Oh, okay. Latin, okay? Okay. And I ending for the nominative plural. Okay, well, listen, I want to tell you, Michael, I am so proud to uh, have you come and visit me on Father's Day with your daddy. I have coffee out of a coffee mug that you sent me with uh, some sort of an animal on it. It looked like a... Uh, chameleon. Uh, a chameleon, okay. Uh, but I have coffee out of that one, and uh, I so appreciate your coming. And uh, what are we going to do this afternoon, later? We're going to go fishing, aren't we? Fishing? What are we going to fish for? 
trout, most likely, and possibly some big mouth bass. I think it's going to be mostly big mouth bass because it's going to be in a pond, and you don't find trout like to have running water, you know, so they can, so they like on a river. Uh, so it's probably going to be big mouth bass. Okay, well, listen, let's hope we catch one. If we do, uh, are you going to fix it for supper? Well, I don't really have a, um, what's it called, Dad? A uh, fishing thing that allows you, that that gives you permission to, like, license. license a oh. license. Yeah, you need a license to take the fish and kill it and cook it. Because, I mean, like, there's a fish control thing now, which saves the fishies. Okay. Anyway, but yeah. Well, all right. I just want you to know we're going to go to a privately owned pond, so we don't need a license. We could catch a hundred of them and bring them back and fix them up for supper and freeze them, okay? And the police can't do a thing for us, against us. But we, if, we, if we catch one, we'll do that one, okay? And if we don't, I, I, as a person who does, who used to do fly fishing, I would always take the, the hook out of the fish's mouth and throw the fish back in the water because I like fish and I think they deserve to live. So maybe if you catch a 15 pound bass, uh, you'll let me hold it while you take the, the hook out of the mouth and we'll throw the bass back. It may be a daddy bass who has some children, okay? All right. Okay, thanks for your interview. You're welcome.